When you know what is going on with your life, you also know what is going on with the world. Your own clear perception of what is happening in here, that perception is the radiating light that not only enlightens your own interactivities, but it's the same undivided light that illuminates everything that happens out there, whether it's politics or a family relationship, commerce. You will therefore understand and be free of the exterior world as you are free of yourself. So you see, there is no point at all in you trying to understand that horrible world out there without first understanding the horrible world inside of you. Because it is the dissolution of the inner lunatic asylum that frees you from involvement with the outer asylum. We can illustrate it. Here's a, say you live on top of a little hill and you look down and there's a dangerous intersection, five-way, eight-way traffic below you, dangerous intersection. Once every few days, there's a crack up down there. Cars come from opposite directions, crash into each other. Another two days, another, a truck and a car. Next day, two more cars constant series of accidents outside your window, down below you, crashes, which you see all year long, but you are not involved with them. Right? What you see is something that is clear to your mind. You can even see why it happened. This car over on the right was going too fast and the car on the left the man was blabbing to someone and wasn't paying attention to the intersection you can see why it happens the single great point for you to grasp right now and once you grasp it don't let it go is that your own clearness makes you this free, perceptive, casual, easy observer without involvement of all that happens out there. Now look at it from another viewpoint. As I am talking to you now, go through your mind and think of all the attachments, involvements, strains and stresses that you have that you think are connected with that exterior marriage person situation. Now there would be no outer horrible marriage There'd be no horrible financial situation for you out there if it wasn't first in here. I tell you, there is no such thing, never has been, never will be, there is no such thing as an exterior difficulty. World War II and one and all the wars before and after there's no problem to you if you're free. All the millions of homes with their heartaches and their strife. What is that to you? Well, that family down the street fighting and you hear them as you walk by 
that family fighting and you make comments on it to your husband or wife, oh, that horrible man, or oh, that poor woman, or whatever. When you do that, you are involved by self-invitation, and now you've got something to talk about. Now you've got someone to compare yourself to. You, you don't throw plates at your husband, maybe. Maybe you feel like it, but you don't, you don't do it. But yet you get a thrill out of thinking about, talking about, emotionalizing about someone else's difficulty. You see what that means? That means that you want as a first priority to be involved with internal difficulties, questions, inquiries. You want to be involved with them instead of simply cutting them out. You, you, listen to, listen to this. How many problems are out there in the world? Trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon trillions. If you were not living psychologically, inwardly, psychically, if you are not living in that world with its trillions of problems, is there even one problem for you? None. Now, we might as well get it out of the way. All the do-gooders and all the liars and all the religious hypocrites and all the weasels and other types of unpleasant animals, they, of course, will say, you're cold, you're indifferent, you don't care about people. We are involved. We're sending food to that country. We're sending workers to that next country to show them how to grow their own wheat and build their own homes. We are involved with the world. We are helping the world. I hope you understand that if you have a, a wrong motive for helping another person, which you will have if you're intellectual only, then you are doing the opposite of what you say you're doing. You are preventing them from going. Every human being must make up his mind that he is, only, oh, is going to grow inwardly, spiritually, through his own efforts, or he is not! And God help you if you play God and judge that you have the power and intelligence to save another human being. You have no such power at all. Your conceit has pseudo power. Oh, how cowardly to help another person. Not help. It's cowardice. It's doing the work of weasels to go out and help other people. That's because you, you have determined to remain personally a member of the zoo. Whether you're a weasel or a crocodile or a buzzard. These people who go around helping other people in any way at all, psychologically, spiritually, food-wise, financially, encouragement even. These people are the destroyers of the world because, as I just pointed out, they are involved with the world. And both the so-called helper and the person being helped are part of the conspiracy to keep this a dark, sick, evil, hateful world. What remnants, maybe large remnants, are still alive in you, which prevents you from seeing and doing in your personal life what I've just explained, which is to cut yourself off from everyone. Don't help anyone! Don't be what you call kindly to anyone. What remnants, large remnants, do you still have in you that are unseen, that are dark, that are insidious, 
by which you you sneakily lie to yourself and say I will know who I am I will be a good person I'm not on a part of rioters or people in war I'm a good person I give things to people I do what little bit I can to make this a better world I'm, I, I'm very sorry for all of you that you won't permit yourself to look down into that deep cave with a powerful light of insight so that you see what I'm talking about so that that would lead you to stop trying to be a good person you are not good because you are still desperate. You still want someone or something to support your delusions of being secure. You'll do anything. You'll sell your spirit, at least for a while, until you wake up. You'll do anything to hang on to the security of having something to say about yourself preferably good and pleasant but wrong if necessary harsh if necessary see how you you are involved altogether with your own life now can you see this in other people first of all? It's easier at the start, of course, to see others and you mustn't get self-righteous about it. When you talk to people during the break, why don't you make a little experiment to see, first of all, that it's compulsive talking, second, they're talking about themselves. These are the people who have been in this class for years. This is a case of hearing not being able to do because you have decided that you want involvement with your world and now you are stuck and I'll tell you what you're stuck with you're stuck with taking wrong impressions from whatever you see out there so that those impressions come inside and distort the whole psychic system so you can now close your eyes and dream you must see you must put that spotlight so deep into that cave so you can see that you are indeed out of control that you cry a lot that you lie a lot and you you don't know what you're doing we will show you how to not be one of the drivers coming from either the left or the right down at that dangerous intersection. We'll show you how to be one of the drivers, how that you are one of the drivers, and then show you how to walk up the hill so that you live in that house up there. And you look down, and this, this state, this life can be described in various ways. It can be, be called a state of detachment, right? Aren't you detached from the accident? You're not part of it. By the way, suppose when you see an accident, a common accident out in the street, have you ever noticed your reactions to it? What was it? Uh, glad that something exciting happened to you because you've been bored the last five minutes? Curious as who got hurt or how badly? You look at the car and you see the police and the flashing lights. That is a perfect example of involvement with the negative world. Why did you get involved in that accident? Because you're bored. Would you make an effort the next time you see an accident to remember what I'm talking about today? And would you, would you make an effort not to close your eyes to the physical fact of it? If you go by it and you see an accident, the policeman says, pull over to the left there so you don't hit the other cars. You, of course, do all that. You're aware, aware of it physically. At the same time, watching the signal right ahead, 
watching your own driving, being aware of the driver a little bit close to because of the accident and all that. But most of all, the primary exercise is to see what's going through you at the time, to see how much you still want to get involved. How about uh, imagination going back to the past? Maybe you were in an accident, an accident one time or a friend or relative was and it associates to that. Can you notice that you went to that association? Maybe a third, fourth, or fifth. When are you going to stop it? You could have stopped it instantly had you stayed awake when you saw it. So you said instead of ruminating, instead of going into repetitious thoughts about it and getting that dull gaze in my eyes, you can kind of straighten yourself up a little bit in your driver's seat in the car. You can look around, be aware of yourself. And you can, you can know at that minute that you stopped yourself from being dragged into the world, right? You ever done that? Isn't that an interesting experience? To not let the world drag you in. Now, the way you are now, you are a willing victim. I talked about sacrifice the other night. Would you sacrifice for the first time the feeling of pleasure you get out of drifting internally, doing the e easy thing. Isn't that an easy thing to go in an association? You know that. Take another situation where you're talking with someone or working with them, maybe down at the factory or at home or whatever, and there's a little disagreement between you. At that moment, watch the devil up behind the twelfth tree. See if you can catch him before he goes to the eleventh, which is an association in your mind, and the tenth and on up. See how quick you can catch that mechanical automatic association where you dislike your husband for the moment because of what he did. Or you wonder why he always does things the same way instead of your way, of course, which you consider superior. How soon can you how soon can you stop yourself from going completely asleep, which means lost in the vastness of your own wilderness, which is the same thing as the wilderness out there. And I will repeat a triumphant fact to you. If you don't bother yourself, you can't be bothered by any activity out there. None at all. You can read about it in the paper. You can see it with your own eyes. Nothing can bother you because there is no equivalent of it inside you. All right, back to the original point. You're up on the hill again, looking down. Look, look listen to this. On Monday, two trucks crash, the roar and an explosion down there. And you're up there looking, and you know the police are on the way. You hear the sirens, you see the, you see the confusion and the madness of an accident. And automobile accidents aren't the only accidents. Everything out there is accidental because human beings are accidental, they're not conscious. Now. Since you are not involved in that accident, you didn't get hurt. You weren't driving the truck. And you're up at your window looking down as a detached observer. What is your condition? Let's say a person actually does that and he's mature in his mind. He's not a bundle of emotions. And he sees the crash and he hears the police coming and all that. He looks down and all he sees are the facts of the physical and even the psychological situation. Maybe someone off to a side is crying. What is the inner condition of the detached observer? 
He sees and he understands. He is not involved in it at all. He understands, as I said before, he understands why that accident happen. But what is his condition? It's a condition that you must attain here in this life. And when you do, do you see how this is an entirely different condition than you being a marvelous helper of humanity or of your next door neighbor? That person looking through the window down the hill to that crash, that person is the only one in the whole state who, because he, he or she understands the cause of the accident, he's the only one who can show them how to correct it. He has a higher solution, does he not? He looks down and he, he could tell the police or the highway engineers he could tell them exactly one point, two point, three point, just what's the problem. Because he can see. He says, well, you've got to lower the speed limit over there. You've got to put a warning sign, dangerous intersection. You've got to cut down those trees that obscure the vision of cars approaching the intersection. He gets a list of ten things to do. And if he were to give this list to the policemen and the engineers, they would do all this. And there wouldn't be any more accidents parallel, spiritually speaking, here in this class, we do exactly that. We give you a list of 10, 50, a thousand rules by which you can be the observer, the innocent, detached observer on top of the hill looking down and understanding what could prevent future accidents if they would listen, if they would take them and obey them. Now let's follow our illustration a little bit more. And I guarantee you what I'm going to tell you is a true story. Now this is a story right about the world out there. Suppose that was you up in the house looking down and you see it. Oh, it's very clear to you all these things that I outlined a minute ago that you have to do to prevent accident. Another sign, slippery road and uh, rain weather or whatever. Now suppose you took the list, ah, and you know, now look, remember, because you're not a part of the accidental world, you, you live above it, you're a good person. You really are. You really, you really have compassion. You know that when cars crash, it destroys human lives, injures people, destroys property. Was that truck, both those trucks worth 80,000 apiece, destroyed. And you have a good mind. You have a right mind. You, you, you don't like waste. Even of a truck, you don't like it. Your, economic, your natural sense of economics has been recovered. And if you haven't recovered yours, if you're a spendthrift, if you go out to expensive restaurants, you do stupid things like that, you don't belong here. Either hear that or you better come back more often. Or you better come back and listen. You lose your sense of economy, that goes always along with losing your soul. I guarantee you that's a truth. You watch how economical rightly you get. You don't want to waste things. All right, you're up on the hill, looking down. And you're bright and alert, and you make your ten suggestions. And you walk down, and there's policemen and the highway engineers who have heard that this is a bad corner, so they came to investigate this accident. You take the list and, and you walk up to the engineer and say, I live up the hill there and I've been watching these crashes for years now. And I've studied them, every angle. You, you sir, can't do it because you're down here and you can't see what I can see up there. But oh, I can see everything. I can see the cars approaching. I can see how drivers don't slow down when it starts to rain. I've studied it thoroughly, sir. If you make these 10 changes down that intersection, Accidents will cease to happen. Now, I'm talking about actually a physical social scene like that. I'll tell you what will happen. In all likelihood, you hand them the piece of paper with all these marvelous suggestions, and that's the absolute end of it. In all probability, 
They're, gonna, they're not going to contact you anymore. They're, they're not going to follow up the suggestions. They're not going to change anything. Do you know why? Because human beings are sick. They're so sick. So egotistical. Don't tell me. I'm the engineer. I went to college for 20 years. They're so sick that they would listen to me. They don't care if 500 more people get killed at that intersection as long as they can say, I'm the one who knows. Don't you tell me what to do. I am telling you, you don't know it. No wonder you don't get anywhere. You don't know how bad it is. I try to tell you at every meeting. Nothing will change for the reasons I, I just gave to you. He'll take the piece of paper and he'll look at it. And his own egotism, his own vanity, and his fear of passing them on to someone else, a thousand reasons why he wouldn't take them and go, in, go into uh, making the place safe. Oh, I forgot something. I better remember it to you. If that intersection, which is representative of all accident in intersections, if that intersection was made safe, you could lay off 10% of the policemen, couldn't you? You could lay off 10% of the, the highway engineers, couldn't you? The company who supplies cement for the highway all around there, you wouldn't need that, would you? So they, the highway company wouldn't get that profit that ordinarily get if accidents continued to happen. The company who manufactures the signals, those signals get all mangled in an, an accident. So they don't want accidents to happen. It'll cut their business 20%. That means they, they just don't have enough money then for the president to buy that new mansion that he wants. You, you, you think I'm kidding you. You think I'm exaggerating. Do you know how evil you are? Do you know how evil you are? How greedy you are? How you will do something just to get another $5? So will the next man. So will the next woman. All right. You're up on the hill again, looking down, spiritually speaking. Now you understand why the world doesn't want what goes on here. Do you, well, you're here in this physical room here. Do you want it? Don't kid me. You prove to yourself by doing something that is terribly painful. Suppose the highway engineer did take that list of 10 things. Wouldn't he have to go through a lot of pain to carry them out? To take the lead in saying, well, listen, listen to this, see, see if you can grasp something as noble as this. He would say, he'd take the, he would say, wow, what clarity, how plain, that's right. Here, I've had all these degrees in, in, in how to plan highways so they don't have accidents. And here's a little scribbled note of 10 points right in front of me. Well, that, that's, I went to 20, 20 years to school, and here it is right in front of me. Much better put than that. You know what I'm talking about? We give, you, we give you lists, and you look at it, and your personal self-centered world comes in and takes away the seed that could have been planted to, to give a beautiful life. Again, your choice. Look, look, you're already suffering. Will you agree on that? You're already in pain. It's all confused. You're a wreck and you're a liar. You're so deluded. You don't even know you're deluded. You don't know you're deluded. You ought to see some of the sick letters we get or I get personally. You ought to see some of the sick letters. The writer doesn't know he's sick. All right. Now, since you're already a patient in the lunatic asylum, what harm, I, I'm going to put it in a certain way. If you're a lunatic in, in the nut house, which you are, what harm can come to you if you listen to and obey the instructions for escaping? Now no, no, look, you say, I'm afraid of the guard because he's brutal and he has a whip and a hard face. I'm afraid of the guard. Look, look at, I'm giving you 
logic you never heard before. I'm afraid of the guard. If I try to, I, I want there's something in me that wants to escape, but I'm afraid of the guard. He watched me every minute. Look, please understand this. You say you're afraid of the guard, therefore you don't try to escape. Look, you're, you're afraid no matter what you do. Why don't you, in your fear, try to escape? Don't say, when I, if I can get past the guard or find some way, stop being afraid of them, then I'll try to escape. You must try to escape right in the middle of your fear. That's all you've got. There's nothing else. So what have you got to lose? Don't, he's, he's six feet tall, eight feet tall, and he's got a hard helmet on, he's got, got the whip. You're already afraid, why don't you try to escape while being afraid? You have nothing to lose, fear is all there is. However, if I try to escape while being afraid, maybe something different will happen, it will. You don't know that yet. You think it's, you think, heaven help you, you think that your fear of that guard with the whip is protection. Someone, that guard gives me attention. He's always watching me. See? Now, inwardly you have invented the guard. You want there to be one. You want a brute. You want someone because now, how marvelous. You're the tied down prisoner who can't get out. It may take you years to see the depths of what I'm telling you. Start right now so it only takes you days maybe. You must act while you're afraid. Act to go out, which means complete rebellion against everything in you that is hardened and frozen that likes to say, I want to get out, but that fierce guard will whip me if I do. It should make no difference to you at all. If you're right in the middle of the lunatic asylum, and it's a space of three blocks out to the gate, you should have no concern at all if for a minute you start walking out toward the front gate, he whips you all the way, which he will. What am I talking about? Do you understand? I'm talking about you saying you're going to get out of your own personal mental lunatic asylum and you will indeed be assaulted by the brutes, the, the foolish, insane beliefs, convictions that you have that want to keep you in there. Why don't you say, I'm getting out? And why don't you say it with as much emotion, conscious emotion, as I just gave you? I'll finish like this. Start all over. Start right now. And do this one thing. Fight endlessly for your own escape. Don't let anything take it away from you. Take a break. You are and you do what you truly love. Take that home with you. It will explain everything you do and don't do to you. You are and you do what you truly love. In reality, there is no division at all between any action of yours, any thoughts you have, and what you love. There's no division. They are one thing. State it another way. This is very profound. At any given moment that you do something, think something, say something, feel something, at that precise moment, that is what you love most of all to the exclusion of any alternative behavior or thought or feeling. 
in reality, in a very deep sense, you are never really divided. Now we talk about schizophrenic behavior and you having all sorts of different impulses and peoples inside of you and that's true but you have to understand that and what I'm talking to you about now put them both together and you'll see there's no contradiction see how easy it is at any moment whatever you have permitted to dominate control your life an action a word a compulsion at that very moment that is all there is what else is there when there's only one thing see so at that moment you are one person one of the many persons that are clamoring inside of you and that one person I hope this doesn't complicate it more, but make it clearer. That one person, that one thought or act can be either true or false. Okay? Haven't you had a, a right idea about, you know, out in the world, whatever, a right idea to do your work better next time, something like that? Haven't you had a right idea in this room or spiritually out in the world? Well, you said you're going to you're going to go against as best you understand that some of those those little demons in there that are nagging you and making you so sick you're all sad aren't you you're all sad therefore at any moment you do what you love now you might love evil and you do of course because you're all lost if you love evil then that's your love of the moment correct at that moment so in that sense, since there's only one thing going on, that is what you love, what you do at any given moment. Now, here's the difficulty. Crowding your life are these thousands of compulsions, thoughts, beliefs, wishes, tears, crowding through your mind and life they take you over these thousands of them and you here's your problem now you are unable to distinguish between those that are good for you and those that are bad believe me and believe truth if you could distinguish between the good and the bad for you you would only choose the good but you can't distinguish and the reason you can't is because there's too much of you in your own life right now what does that mean too much of you in your own life the clamoring desires the the wish to please other people so that they'll be pleased with you talk about slavery in this world there's nothing worse than psychological slavery and there's nothing worse than that that what is worse than that is to not know that you're a psychological slave that you want to please people and you want look and you, you listen to this among those people you want to please is you people the people inside of you that seem to be so friendly and have you noticed that you don't notice the flip-flop inside of you see if you can understand this phrase self-betrayal I will tell you all of you here in this room and listening to this that you are in a state of self-betrayal unseen because you love what you shouldn't love you love the familiar you love the vanity pleasing you love the easy way out we're here we're here to say no matter how hard it is I'm going to go against it I'm going to give myself the jolt of no longer pleasing no longer pleasing the inner tyrant 
that has tyrannized so long. So the problem is that we don't understand that any given moment we are taken over by this impulse, that compulsion, which acts in our name, which calls itself the all, and then you don't know that a few minutes later, a few seconds later, another tyrant leaps up and takes over and wants to take charge of the ship. What kind of a course do you think your life is going to take when you have ten captains in ten hours? And, by the way, maybe you've noticed this, the ten captains quarreling among themselves. I know the right way and you don't. Isn't that your life? Always Aren't you always quarreling with yourself? Of course you are. Now I want to follow this thought into a specific area. And I hope you can see 10, 20 lessons in it. As I'm talking to you, I have to choose which way I'm going to go and leave the others for another talk. So here's where we're going right now. Pathetic person. Remember we talked about that once. I want to take it up again and go in a little different direction. This does not apply to children, what I'm going to say. Children have not developed to the point where they have chosen the love of being a pathetic person. They're undeveloped yet. This applies to all adults, including young adults. A pathetic person is someone, we'll describe him first, is someone who has chosen to be in love with defeat. A pathetic person is someone who has abandoned his opportunity to be a good, true, spiritual student has abandoned that to delusion which he does not wish to see. A pathetic person is an actor or an actress. And most of the time, because other people eventually get tired of watching his performance, most of the time a pathetic person plays to the audience of himself. He's both the actor and the individual in the audience applauding or throwing vegetables at the performance. But in either case, the pathetic person always has someone to talk to, which is himself. Now, all of you listening to me have the pathetic person inside of you. And it expresses itself in various ways, such as the following. You feel sorry for yourself. You feel that you have been treated badly by your spouse. You feel that life hasn't given you a chance. And if you'd had that chance, you could have made something for yourself. And already, you're a thousand miles out into darkness to ever want to do anything for yourself. Anytime you do anything for yourself, the very fact that you do something means that you have a false self that you're going to do something for which will echo back, boomerang back, and knock you down. But by this time, you got so used to being knocked down to fighting that that is your chief pleasure in life. That is your love. How many of you love to fight? Raise your hand. You can all raise your hand. You know you love to fight. I didn't say with fists necessarily. You know that. You love inward quarreling, little disputes. You, you, you set up your mental movies of the, the husband or wife or whoever and have fights with them. There's only one way to get true judgment as these millions of thoughts go through your life so fast. I'll tell you what it's called in simple terms again. It's called yield your judgment. Get it down. I tell you, there's no other way. Yield your judgment. But you won't yield your judgment. All you do is see and love because you loved it before. Now, how ridiculous. 
how foolish to love something simply because it is there. Please, what is there is something that you don't see as a folly, as something unreal that you have said is real, that you cling to in order to keep your, man, your mind uh, filled with false loves, false affections. Go home today, take your piece of paper and a pencil and see if you have the daring to write down all your false loves. And I'll tell you, it's so easy to do. And I'll tell you how to do it. You take your piece of paper and you put it at the top of it. Love truth. Put it at the top. Love truth. Anything else is false. And the head of the list of all that is false is anything that has to do with your present ways of thinking about yourself and your life and other people. Your mind is a madhouse. I can prove right now that your mind is a madhouse, every, every one of you, because you don't know what to do about it. You could know what to do about your madhouse mind. We go into it every day and night here. But you're so resistant to the fact that you were lost out in the wilderness with your pet thoughts, with your pet associations, oh, with your pet lies, that has so taken over your entire life. And you have a hardened spirit, and there is no hope for you. I'm going to tell you something. I'm tired of fooling around with you people. There's no hope at all for you, as long as you prefer to be hard. There's two or three new people here this morning, them and you too. I'm going to put it right in front of you. There's no way you can miss it. You can get mad, which you probably will because you're such idiots. Unless you make an effort to come to every single class here in a right spirit, or if you live in another distant place and have to live and work there, that's understood. Unless you take tapes and books back and be here in spirit, if you can. Unless you come to every class, either right in this room here, or home, or you work with other people, perhaps, or all by yourself. Unless you do that, you are lost, and you're going to stay lost, just as you are now. You're lost now. I am telling you, you're lost now. You will stay that way. Unless you come to every meeting, that's it. What, what did your hardened mind, your idiotic, childish, imbecilic, dangerous mind say to that? Don't you dare go into a pathetic performance when I tell you that. Why is he yelling at me? What did I do wrong? You wouldn't be able to take it if I told you what you did wrong. Let me tell you what you did wrong and what you do wrong. What is wrong is you remaining you. What else? Everything you are is wrong. And everything that you express out of that insanity is wrong. Everything. How can you get sanity out of a lunatic asylum? Everything that happens inside the lunatic asylum is mad. And when those mad people go out into the streets and the towns, they bring their madness with them. You, you, you ought to feel sorry for everyone you meet, for their misfortune in coming in contact with you. Look what you do to them. What are you like? 
That is what you do to everyone you meet. And you, in your incredible vanity, think that you not only have something to give to people, but you have something good and beneficial and helpful. You're, you're totally mad. Now, I want to repeat that one of your hideouts is to be pathetic in your own eyes. And you'll play the game publicly, too, where you think you can get a reward. Women often play the pathetic game with a man. It's one of their most prominent acts, by the way. They, they know how stupid men are. Women, who are stupid themselves, of course, but they know how stupid men are. And they play the role and get what they want. And they flip-flop. Just as a man flip-flops toward a woman, a man, vice versa. You ladies flip-flop toward a man, don't you? Once you've got what you want, and you're tired of him. Well, since we're speaking historically, I'll, I'll give you a little story. There was a man born in the United States a few years ago. And all his childhood, he was a pathetic young man. He grew up in the somewhere in the South, I think. Traveled around, a failure at everything, pathetic in his own eyes and everybody looked, a complete flop. A very sick, sick-minded young man. And he grew up to see how soon you can identify him. And he grew up and he'd stand on street corners and put out political tracts to whoever would take them. And his face was always contorted or hard as it is in pathetic people like that. I'm calling him a pathetic man now so that you'll be able to see the contrast later and you'll see the point of what we're talking about. One time he decided that he liked communism. So he applied to the Russian embassy in the United States to move to Russia, which he did. And he moved to Russia and worked in a factory of some kind there, married a Russian girl. And then, you know, a sick Sick people are always in love with something false. And then they change their mind, right? Always changing their mind, always tired of their love, always getting tired of their love. He got tired of his love for communism, applied for permission to come back to the United States, which was granted. So he came back with his wife. Remember now, he's a pathetic little man. You see him on the street and he asks you for a quarter, you might give him a quarter. Because he couldn't hold employment very long. And he finally found employment in a school depository bookshop. Know the rest of the story? This, this pathetic little man finally killed the President of the United States and 30 minutes later, by the way, a, a policeman finally captured. And do you see the, see the justice of it? Do you see that violence does beget violence? Understand, we're talking about Oswald, of course. You are walking on the most shaky ground possible as long as you feel sorry for yourself, as long as you have this pathetic person that you have so much affection for, and I'll tell you why. Because there is an opposite to your self-image of being sorry for yourself. And I'll tell you what it's called. It is called violence. And you will do violence unto yourself. Nobody else on the earth may see it. And you do yourself physical damage. It'll catch up to you sooner or later. If you are insane and stay insane, it's going to affect the body in one way or another. It's going to affect your nerves going to affect your sleep. Look, the outlaw runs away from the sheriff and he dodges behind the rocks, right? And he goes out in the desert and he goes up into the mountains. He gets away from the sheriff by a, for a while. You can't escape reality. Sooner or later, it's going to catch you. Now, now why don't you understand that so that you stop the damage you are doing by loving the thrill of being an outlaw and you say to yourself in your incredible madness the more persecution the better because now look at poor me.
Never had a chance. Just wait for the flip-flop. Just wait for the $379 million lawsuit that's out in the world. We are far more concerned with the suit you file against yourself. Now you've got the complainer, whatever the plaintiff is, the one who complains and the one who's complained against. Now you've got both of them inside of you. Now you're fighting each other. Solution. I give you solutions. I give you answers, and they're so simple. You won't do what's simple. You're too in love with the complicated of dodging the sheriff. You know, if you were to give up to the sheriff who represents truth, you'd tremble as you walk toward him and drop your guns and put up your hands. But you would find out that you had been forgiven all along. There's been a pardon all along. But that's another story, isn't it? All right, we have our two, two angels to illustrate the next point. Not the veteran angel this time and the apprentice, but two veteran angels. A little different approach, right? Two veteran angels sitting on the cloud, their feet dangling over the edge. Pretty good picture, huh? You, you, you like that especially, you know, the legs dangling over the edge of the cloud. You know, they were casual. They'd been in the heavenly business a long time. And they were sitting up there, and they were looking down at humanity. And they'd look down, and then they'd look at each other, and they'd say, too bad, too bad. They'd look down again, they'd see people hurting each other. They'd see sick people, sexually sick, financially sick, mentally sick, socially sick, marriagely sick, all kind of sick people. And they'd look at each other and they'd say, too bad, too bad. Now our trainee angel comes along. We get him in at last. He comes over and he sees these two vets sitting up there and saying, too bad, too bad. And he came along and he said, what's too bad? And they said, sit down on the edge of the cloud and we'll talk it over. So he sat down, eager to learn. And they said, it's too bad they don't look up. It's too bad they don't look up because they did that. The very looking up would indicate to them something that is higher than the level of humanity, than the level of society, than the level of earth. Too bad they don't look up. Because looking up, you see, is a right thought, a thought you can well be in love with and should be in love with. You, you look up. That means you now see you now see something you never saw before. You now, for the first time here, you are 30, 40, 80 years old, and you never really realize that there is someone outside of you in this world. You are so involved with this world and connecting everything with your wants. What can I get? How can I avoid getting punished? You, you, never, you never knew that there was something, someone beside you that's what's called pure conceit. You look up, and you see there's another level. Now, what does looking up mean? It means to come here. If you, if you don't come here, you're not going to get it. You're going to continue with your own propaganda. Here in this room, we will help you to see what it means to look up. And what it means to look up is to painfully take your, oh, it's, it's pretty difficult. It means to painfully take your eyes off of yourself, which in turn means that you know that there's another power besides mental power, which has its own place. There's, an, there's another force besides thinking. There is something else besides thinking. And at, at first it's called seeing. You look up and you see the angels up there, that is, you see something higher, which then instructs you, and after that instruction comes the crisis of your life, because after the instruction, you either yield or you refuse. 
If you refuse, don't you forget, all of you remember this, if you re keep refusing while not knowing you're refusing, you will never know that you're refusing, therefore you will never be able to break that malicious habit and start accepting. The tragedy is not that you are an alcoholic or that you are insane or that you have a fighting spirit toward everyone. That is not the problem. The problem is that you want to remain in those false loves. You want to remain in those rather than, rather than yield everything to God. I warn you over and over, I warn all of you listening to me, unless you permit the truth in this class to show you the difference between true and false loves, the day will come absolutely when you'll no longer be able to distinguish, and worse than that, you will no longer have the wish to be able to distinguish between, I'll put it simply, between what is authentically good for you and what is authentically bad for you. You don't, you don't have to come here with strength. You don't have to come here with wisdom. You don't have to come here with judgment. You have none of the three. Look, see God is better than you are. God is love. You are not. Therefore, you can't conceive the simplicity of what God asks of you. Now, you take paper and pencil and you write down that one word, yield. It is everything. Yield means everything. Because if you don't yield, you'll never know what you could have had by yielding. You'll never know. And you'll never know that you are living in hell, which you call heaven, and you call it heaven because you're surrounded by mirrors which reflect only you. And you won't know what's going on. Here, we will give you the direction, which is any direction. Look, if you're sur surrounded all by mirrors, what direction? Go any direction. Smash through the mirrors. I'll tell you again what I'm very grateful for, and the rest of you can be equally grateful. Some of you here come to me, come to truth, and say, Help me to smash through, to get outside of the circle of mirrors of myself. Help me to smash through. Oh, what a delight, what a pleasure. Let's talk. Let's go into it. Let's discuss it. Let's see all the blunders we make. And never mind the blunders, let's go again. And you rush toward the mirror and you get bumped and it knocks you down. You go to an, another mirror and you see yourself and fall in love with the image. That's all you are in love with is an image. Don't you know that? The power of imaginary delusion is enormously powerful. You can be a monster in human form and walk up to any one of those mirrors and see what you think is an angel. Because your utterly depraved, confused, distorted mind can make you see what you are not. You think you're nice? You're not. There's, there's none of you in this. You're not nice. You're cruel, you're vicious, you're deluded, you're sick. You want the chance you've been given here? Come back in spite of all the hardness that you call hardness. And thank heaven, I personally right now am not responsible for what you do with what said with the truth has been given to you. I'm so glad 
that I personally can ignore evil in this room, that I don't have to have anything to do with it, that I can push it away just by ignoring it to death, as far as I'm concerned. What you do with your state is a different matter. Put everything together that we've talked about. Put the word yield on the top of another one of your pages. Carry it around with you. Let it remind you of what you have to do in order to stop self-deception. Yielding is all you need to do. I told you you don't have to be strong. You don't, you don't have to understand even. You just have to yield. When God sees a yielding heart, he begins to send understanding toward it, and you will feel it, and it will live for you. There are two kinds of wrong states. The first wrong state is not knowing the realities of this existence, your life. You don't know for example, that you are an undeveloped man or woman engaged in a wide variety of both exciting and boring earthly activities. You don't know that you are a struggling human being. That's one of the realities that you don't know. You don't know that you were confined to visiting your own old unnatural nature every moment, visiting it and getting advice, guidance, foolish guidance from it. You don't know that your only source of help, assistance is you. Furthermore, you don't know that when you unseeingly go to yourself for help, that you always get the answer that wrecks it more rather than improves it, uplifts it. You don't know the realities of life, existence, in general. You don't know other people. You don't know how everyone who is lost lies to you. And since everyone is lost out there in the world, everyone lies to you in ways which you, being an unconscious mechanical human being, do not see. Therefore, you, I'm talking to you, are the victim of everyone you meet. Anywhere you are. Yes. Right in that home, you're a victim of deceptive people. Right in that building of any kind, you are a victim. You don't know you're a victim. Therefore, one form of ignorance is to simply to not know that you're ignorant. There is a, a veil surrounding you which makes the world out there distorted, obscure, and since it is obscure, looking through this veil that is between you and the world, in, no matter what direction you turn in, whether it's toward your family, toward finances, or whatever, because there is this obscure veil between you, and when you look out, everything is distorted and hazy and vague, you in your fear of the obscurity, and not knowing what to do with it, you say to yourself, since I am scared by what I see out there and don't know what to do about it, I will invent something to do about it. And so you do, and that is the mistake of humanity. 
That is the explanation for everything that is dreary, that is sad, that is defeated. Don't you want to sometimes just crawl in the corner of your bed and pull the covers over and sink into oblivion? Of course you do. Of course the world does. This is what the world lives in a, their little bedroom with the blankets over their head, eyes closed. And in your terror of not understanding life in reality, you say, I will do something about it. And there's the mistake. What you do, you're standing here, and here's the obscure, obscuring veil, and beyond is the world, a sick world, a violent world, a world filled with hatred, filled with deception and lies. That's the world you live in, whether you see it or understand it or not. But you view the world through the veil, and not understanding it, because the confusion and immaturity is in you, you are the veil, you understand. You, you are the only veil there is. The only veil there is for you is you. Instead of doing the, wrong, the right thing, you do the wrong thing. And the wrong thing you do is to very cleverly, cunningly, foolishly, destructively say to yourself, since I don't see clearly what is going on out there, I will put my own interpretation on it. I will therefore, in my confusion and fear, see the world as I want to see it in an attempt, an effort to lower my agony, my fear, my anguish. Then I can say to myself, ha ha! I have succeeded in understanding what life is all about, both me and outer life. I understand what it's all about. Therefore, and now comes the supreme lie, the monstrous lie. You follow all that preceding dialogue by adding to it by saying, Now I understand. Now I am safe. But look at the only thing you have done is to lie to yourself and say, I understand, I am safe, when you don't understand and you're still shaky. But you don't see this. You refuse. You say, no, I've got it settled. Don't upset me. Don't disturb me. Don't question me. Don't challenge me. Don't you dare question what I say is true because I have found security. My religion has given me peace. Woe unto you who have lied so long, so hard that you no longer can be told that you are lying yourself all the way downhill. Woe unto you who have become so hardened, so vicious, so violent <clears throat> that you can't see that everything you do and say, the very look on your face is a destructive falsehood and now you are a human being with no conscience. I have described the world and my question to you listening to me is, have I described you? I will answer the question, yes, I have. Now you know it. You know that I have very, very accurately put in front of you what you have done and may not have understood up to now that you have done this against yourself, thinking all along that you were doing something for yourself to give you security. You say, I will paint it as a, a beautiful world, oh, a little problems, but a few rough things out there, but nothing drastically wrong. All I have to do is go along with it and, and just think nice thoughts, think nice thoughts toward other people, and they may think nice thoughts toward me. And all, all the time, you, you know inside, if you could see it, 
that it is a, a grand deception, a horrible thing for you to do. And the evidence is that anyone who comes along and challenges your beautiful dream, you will blow up in violence and hatred toward them. Don't you? Don't you? Yes, you do. And I will ask you what your reaction is to what I've been saying to you all along. There's something in you that says, don't tell me that. I already know. I already have it settled. I have my teachers. I have my books. I have my buildings to go to or whatever kind where I get help. I know what I'm doing with my life. You don't know what you're doing with your life and you never have. You can know if you now know that you have never known. That is essential. Will you do it? Or will you close your eyes and, and grow in your hatred toward what could rescue you? Will you, will you keep going downhill instead of, until you run out of range of the voice of truth? I am trying to get you to stop exactly where you are. Right now, not five minutes from now. Not four minutes, not one minute. Right now, as I am talking to you, I want you to know where you are in this room. Those of you listening to me, listening to the cassette tape, or over the radio. I want you to simply know where you are so that that interrupts your unconscious mechanical thought processes for a minute, which will also in interrupt your self-forming self, which is false. Just the little interruption, every as often as you can, by the way. Just, just know where you are. Don't think about anything. You don't have to be thinking all the time. You think you do because you think that you're preserving yourself. Instead, you're preserving your delusions which are making you the very sad, lost human being that you are. Now, I have just told you to act upon the knowledge that you have acquired. I said, first of all, that we don't know. People don't understand their life. You're without knowledge. You're ignorant of spiritual principles. That's the first part. The second wrong thing is to know these facts, to hear them, and refuse to act on them. I gave you an action just a minute ago, simply to sit back, relax, and know where you are without thought. You don't have to think when you're in a state of awareness. Now this is an important point to all of you. You have now heard a few of the realities of life, some of the elementary lessons that you must do in order to not remain what you are, but to become something different in which you will be truly happy. Now you have to make a decision right now whether you're going to, whether you're or not, you are going to do what you know. Think about that. You now know certain things. In the last 15 minutes, you've been given lots of facts, lots of information. The question is, will you now act on what you know, or will you continue to walk around with this veil around you, through which you see dimly the outer world, and continue to distort it, refusing to see. And all refusal to see is always founded in the fear of seeing something that is not you. You are all you have, unfortunately. Your hardness and your trickery and your hatred of other people. Too bad that in your lost state, you are all you have. And you refuse to give it up. You refuse to explore something that is beyond yourself and only by acting on your knowledge that you now have. Now there's no excuse anymore for any of you for not acting because I've followed up certain logical points up to where now you can start to do, act upon, carry out the orders of the spiritual, of your own spiritual nature, which now has just a little bit of right knowledge, which you can now agree with and act with. Let me give you an illustration. 
Imagine an executive of a movie studio. He runs this big movie studio out in Hollywood somewhere. And he takes his small child, let's say it's a boy, he brings a small boy to the studio every day just to show him what Papa does all day long. And he takes the boy by his hand and just shows him around the movie lot. And he leads him down one of the main artificial streets, a uh, movie set. And there's a big southern mansion. They're doing a Civil War story of the Old South. And there's a big southern mansion, the front of it, right? And the little boy paused in front of it. Now you're the little boy, try to understand. And Papa says, this is a, a building that we've built up in part to put in a movie. Now you know what a movie is because you've gone to the theater with me and seen movies on television. The boy nods, he knows, knows what a movie is. And his father says this, will, this house, mansion, will appear in a movie. So the father steps aside to talk with the, another executive who comes over to talk to him for a minute. And the boy stands there and in awe he looks up and he sees this vast southern mansion with the uh, wisteria or whatever is, uh, grows in the south and looks at it. Now, in his imagination, the little boy sees what he wants to see behind the doors. He's a little boy. And first of all, he sees a big playroom that he can run up and down the carpet with and have fun with his boyfriends, little boyfriends who come over for lunch sometimes. And he sees a lot of toys in another room. He sees everything that he personally wants inside the big match in there. Don't we always personalize? When you've been to see a pretty girl, don't you always wish you had her? Of course you do. And then you go into sorrow because you know of all the complications. You're afraid of, of what she'll say when she gets to know you as you really are, huh, man? You can live in ideals of a how, how great you are, but you're afraid for her to see the realities of your real inner nature, and so you stumble and stammer even thinking about her. All right. One day, the father takes his little boy up to the door of the mansion, and he opens the door, and the little boy, the little boy expects to see what he expected to see. The big rooms, the big broad carpet, and the toys, and the candy and the, on the table, all the candy he wants, and the swimming pool beyond where he can swim if he wants. And the father opens the door, and the little boy walks in, and what does he see but weeds and piles of lumber of the rest of the studio lot, right? And he doesn't, he doesn't understand. His father explains. He, he could watch the boy's reaction. You know, the boy looked around, astonished. Where, where are the toys? The boy, father explains. This is just a false front. This is what we do. We don't have to build a whole building. We can just show the front of it. And it represents something. It represents the whole building. The boy understands. What's the point of the illustration? Open the door. You are standing out in the street of fantasy land. The movie studio, a little boy, a little girl, having built up certain ideas of what you're going to find when you walk up and go inside the place. Haven't you had enough experiences in your life where you have been forced by life to open the door and look inside and see nothing? Don't you ever learn from your experiences? Or do you just say, well, this is the exception? I'll tell you, you're very, very foolish if you're going to determine to spend the rest of your life wandering around that vast movie lot, trying the door of the southern mansion going down the street a little bit more and opening the door of the next house and the next one. 
all sorts of all sorts of door, doors and, and all sorts of your imaginations of what is behind them that is at last going to make you happy and take away the ache. Now all of you listening to me have a dull ache and you know it. Don't you? It is unexplainable to you because you have refused to open one door after another, exhausting the studio lot, going through 200 false doors, looking in and seeing that there is nothing at all for you in fantasy land, in movie land, in the fiction factory, there's nothing for you at all, but you have to do what you have to come to that last door. That's what scares you most of all, isn't it? The last one. You know there's 200 fronts there, 199. You, oh, you know, you got married and that didn't work out. You tried the enterprise, some kind, that didn't work out. And all of a sudden you, you, you had a great plan for doing something and you went down the library and read all the books you could about it. And all of a sudden you woke up one morning and you were bored by the whole thing. Ever walk into that kind of a false front? You know how ex you know how excited you were. This is it. Why did you have to say this is it? Because you knew it wasn't it. And you were trying to convince yourself. Never talk to yourself like that. As I said before, it's a conversation with an idiot. <laughs>